This is the book uh, contract, and in the it took many months to do it, and uh, we're still not totally done with it. And the lawyers are enjoying the <laughs> the fees, but uh, I thought you'd like to see the schedule. You know, I, if if I project out what we can do, this is the schedule. Okay, so. Uh, So uh, Dr. Wu, to help grease the contract, he said, can you find a, a book by a Chinese person? Uh, <coughs> and not just Tibetan or Sanskrit books. So uh, I said, no. <laughs> Allison was there. <laughs> and then I said, I don't know any Chinese, and don't ask me. You know, it's just, it's not what I do. You know, then uh, by accident, well, I, I went looking in the ta <laughs> in the Kongyu and Tenger because I know some of the books were translated from Chinese, five, mm -hmm. I think, five in the Tenger that I, that I remember. And uh, <coughs> then I found uh, there's a famous commentary to uh, on Tonge. There's a famous con commentary on uh, interpreting the Buddha. Did the Buddha really mean what he said? And that uh, commentary is one of Jetson Kappa's most famous books. And in the monastery, if you memorize it, you get a prize. It's, it's like 80 pages or something. So you have to stand up in front of 1,500 monks and recite it. And some people do it. Geshe Wangyal did it. Uh, that's a long story. But uh, so anyway, uh, that book's based on a sutra, half of it. It's based on a sutra uh, called uh, What I Really Meant, mm -hmm. uh, San, Sandi, which means gongba, which means what I really meant. Nirmochana means to liberate the meaning, mm -hmm. or to release the moksha, right? Uh, moch, moch is the root, mooch. So uh, mooch doesn't come from that. Uh, <laughs> to release the real meaning. So there's, that, there's this sutra called uh, What I Really Meant, you know, and uh, it's difficult. It has 10 chapters based on 10 questions of 10 bodhisattvas, including Maitreya and uh, Manjushri and Avalokiteshvara and Subhuti. Uh, Subhuti is the only one uh, who the Buddha asked the question. The other nine asked their question. Anyway, there's one name, what's his name? Paramartha Samadgata, a bodhisattva. And he, he asked a question, quest, question number six. He says, uh, you know, you taught, you had three stages in your teaching career, three turnings of the wheel. And uh, in the first one, you, you taught the heaps and, uh, you know, basic things, four truths. And, and, and you seem to say that things were coming from their own side. And then in the second turning of the wheel, which is Heart Sutra, for example, on Vulture's Peak, you said uh, nothing comes from its own side. You said the opposite. And then in the third turning of the wheel, you seem to, what do you call that? Prevacate? Equivocate. E Equivocate. Yeah. It se you seem to say, well, you know, I went too far on the first two. And it's somewhere between. Things are coming partly from themselves, partly from other things. And then that's the mind-only school. And then uh, the Bodhisattva asked Buddha which one was correct in that sutra. And the Buddha gives an answer. And then uh, Tsongkhapa was disturbed by the, uh, the, whole, the whole thing. And he wrote his own commentary. And half of his commentary is based on that sutra. And, and uh, in his commentary, he quotes the Chinese master. But he doesn't give him a name, I think. Uh, but if you go and look up the quotations, it's a it's a, a Chinese master that the Tibetans call Wensek. And uh, and so I went to find this book, and it's it's massive. It's it's uh, two volumes in the Tengyur. It's one percent of the Tengyur by one person, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so that's uh, two thousand. Faces, 2,000 pages. And uh, that's his commentary on the 10 questions. And uh, so his name is Wen Zheng, uh in Tibetan. But uh, 
if you study the Chinese tradition, his name is Yuan Tzu. Yuan Tzu. Yuan Tzu. Yuan Tzu. <laughs> and uh, he was a direct disciple of Xuanzang. Mm -hmm. uh, so Xuanzang is the famous uh, <coughs> Tang Chao, Tang Dynasty Buddhist monk mm -hmm. who decided he wanted to go to India to meet, to see the source of Buddhism. And he asked the Tang Dynasty emperor if he could go, and the emperor said no. <laughs> and then he snuck out anyway. He snuck out of the country, and he went the long way around. You know, he went to Afghanistan and Central Asia, Turkish parts of Asia, and then he went down to India, and then he actually reached Sri Lanka, and he spent 17 years on the road. Uh, and when he came back, the emperor said, you're a wonderful, smart guy. And he built him the Wild, what, Wild Goose Pagoda <laughs> in Xi'an, which in those days was called Chang'an, <laughs> which was the capital of China in those days, which is in central China. And uh, so he built him a tower, and then he translated a thousand books in that tower. He brought back a thousand books, and he translated them with a team, which is why we call this the Red Western Tower, because uh, we want it to be the other. The Western equivalent of the Eastern Tower in Chang'an. So uh, anyway, uh, and, and Mr. Dr. Wu's really been into that, uh, and, and he even centered his, half his activities are in Xi'an, and he has a good relationship with the government there. So anyway, uh, and he has a tower there. He has a, a building there. And uh, so we thought we would sort of be the Western version of that tower, of Xuanzang's tower. And Xuanzang had two great uh, disciples. Uh, one was Yuan Tzu. And the other, do you remember? Kui Ji. Kui Ji. And, and as I understand it, they, they founded their own lineages. Mm -hmm. and, bec and those became a big part of Chinese Buddhism. Uh, and and so if you can, and, and, and I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not clear on this, but I don't believe that uh, Xuanzang wrote a lot of original material. He wrote uh, the greater Tang dynasty records of the Western regions. In, uh, it's a very dry document and long, and I've read it in English, uh, about his journeys. And he went to, I don't know, many countries. And uh, he learned many of the languages uh, where he went. And, uh, and he learned Sanskrit very well. Uh, so in this record, it sounds like he's uh, helping the emperor decide the military value of these places. And you know, it's kind of like espionage or something. Mm -hmm. And he says, what do the people make? What is their nature? How many Buddhist monks are there? Are there? You, in those days, uh, Buddhism spread from Central Asia to India, so it, it was a bigger empire than India. It, it was a huge empire of Buddhism. Uh, and uh, so they respected him, and, and he went to all these countries. And then later, because he didn't get killed or robbed, you know, he got robbed but not really robbed, uh, because he made it back after 17 years, uh, there grew a tradition that he must have had protectors traveling with him. Uh, and then, I don't know, a couple hundred years later, somebody wrote one of the first Chinese novels mm. called Journey, Journey, to the West. Journey to the West. <laughs> and in that novel, Xuanzang is accompanied by like a magic monkey. pig and a pig horse and a monkey. And the monkey's like clever and they save his ass a bunch of times. And uh, <laughs> with the muck rake. Anyway, uh, and then that became one of the most popular books of Chinese literature, and it was made into countless movies and TV shows. <laughs> and Dr. Wu says that's partly why he became a Buddhist, because when he was a little kid, he watched the TV. Uh, there was an animation. Thing. I should have brought a book. I bought a book in the Beijing airport for V's grandson. And then you fold it out, and it pops up. And <laughs> Uh, so it became very popular. Uh, I'm not aware that Xuanzang wrote. Oh, and by the way, he's so precise in his travels. 
he, he even counts steps sometimes that based on his book we were able to find travesty, for example. It was excavated uh, from just empty dirt. They went down and found Shravasti city and they found uh, where the diamond cutter was taught, the gardens of Jetavan. I've been there. And uh, so anyway, he was very precise. And, uh, but I, 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 are you clear? I, I don't think he wrote a lot of his own work. Uh, but his student, uh, Yuan Tse, Yuan Tse? Yuan Tse. Uh, he wrote this commentary, uh, and he also wrote a few other books, uh, but this is his masterwork. And uh, so I was looking at it. This is interesting, because you have to realize this is 700 years before Tsongkhapa, uh, which is sort of amazing. This is around the time of Kamala and, uh, and he wrote this commentary to that sutra. And the history of the sutra now is that the Sanskrit is lost mm -hmm. and it exists in Chinese mm -hmm. uh, and in Tibetan. Uh, and Yuan Tzu's commentary exists in Chinese, but it's incomplete. And it, one Chinese professor has even tried to we translate it back from Tibetan, the parts that are missing. I think he's still alive, this guy. Uh, okay. no. no, he's passed. He's one of the students of mm, Oh, I see, okay. Uh, so anyway, I thought, oh, this is cool. Let's put this in the contract. <laughs> and uh, then I calculated how long it would take to translate it at our current speed. <laughs> uh, it would take 50 years. Uh, so I decided just to do the sixth chapter, mm -hmm. uh, which is the question, the big question about the three turnings of the wheel. You know, so, uh, so then I had this idea, uh, personally I would like to translate his commentary, I read some of it. I think it's going to be not too hard to translate. But it doesn't go as deep as Tsongkhapa. It's, it's, a, it's a respectable commentary and it's uh, solid. I would call it solid, uh, but it's not Tsongkhapa, you know, it's a good commentary. And it's a, he has a lot of, for example, explanation of Sanskrit words and stuff, which are interesting and I think helpful for a translator. Uh, they don't explain emptiness as clearly as Tsongkhapa. Uh, and Tsongkhapa supports some of what he says and he disputes some of what he says. Uh, but I, all in all, if Jetson Tsongkhapa supports most of what you say, you're probably pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, so I think it's worth translating, and I think if it, if, especially if it puts the Chinese government at ease, uh, if we work on something that's an important book of Chinese culture, I think it would be helpful. So I, I would like to translate the whole sutra, all ten questions, because I can translate that like a newspaper, that's easy. And uh, the uh, Yuan-Sis commentary, I think, is pretty easy. And then I would like to throw in Jetson Kampa's commentary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I studied that for many years with my teacher. And it's hard, but I, I understand it now. And uh, so I thought it'd be cool to put out a series of books that covered that whole commentary. And, and I made that part of the contract. So I added it to your books. Then I kind of have this uh, hunger to uh, do it in China. <coughs> you know, I would like to go through it with some Chinese Chinese translators. And uh, so I was talking to Stanley about his team. I'm also very attracted to Shenzhen. Uh, Shenzhen, uh, which you may know or not, uh, it was built artificially. It was a bunch of fields. and. Uh, the other uh, Joe, <laughs> Joe and Lai, no, no, who was it? Xiaoping. Oh, the other Xiaoping, <laughs> Deng, Deng Xiaoping. <laughs> Her name is Xiaoping also. But the other, the other Xiaoping, the less famous one, <laughs> uh, he, uh, he, he said, we're going to try an economic experiment here, and we'll try uh, an economic zone which is going to be, you know, sort of more democratically run or capitalist. 
so he, he experimented with this city and they built a new city. So that city is only uh, about 45 less years old. Yeah, less than 40 years old. It was built purposely. And how many million people now? 22 million. Wow. Million? <laughs> <laughs> 22 million. <laughs> Just barely. <laughs> but it's hot. I, I feel the energy there and I really like it. And I am hungry to go s sit there and help and work there. So anyway, it's all like new. The city's all new. And the people who have moved there from all over China, it's very cosmopolitan. Like people from all over China have come there. Mm. Huawei telephone company, which is probably going to put Apple out of business. WeChat was born. And WeChat, Tencent company was, is there. And somebody else. Baidu. Baidu, the, the yeah, Ali. The Chinese Google, they're all there. And so the, we kind of purposely sent Stanley there to, to find young, hip people uh, and try to attract this kind of people. Uh, so I just feel like I would like to go there. So anyway, I, 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 I haven't run this, I haven't talked to you about it yet, but I, I thought, I was thinking about it. And if, if, if I was going to do it, I think I would do a, uh, there's a thing called EMBA, so it's Executive MBA program. Mm -hmm. And uh, it means you're from a Chinese family. You started your own company after you quit college, like Bill Gates. And, uh, and you got successful. But your mother and father keep asking you, where's the college degree? You know, you're a billionaire already, but your parents want a college degree. This is very Chinese. So, they, there's a thing called EMBA, and uh, you can do it on the weekends. Uh, and it's kind of flexible. You know, you're super rich, you come on the weekends, you have mostly cocktail parties with other super rich guys. <laughs> and then uh, you get a degree. And I believe, although I'd like you to check, I believe Harvard's doing it. People like Yale, Harvard, they're doing EMBAs in China. And they're they're, I think they're like $60,000 a year, and, and you, you just take them out on some weekends and give them a DCI course, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would like to do an EMBA. I, I, I believe you have to have a partnership with a local university. Um, so, and, and I thought, now this is the new part, okay, for Stanley. I thought it'd be cool to do, to sell it to the Chinese government as I wanted, DCI wants to move into EMBA. You know, DCI has been doing public talks, we've been doing public retreats. But I thought to tell them I want to make more money, because they'll understand that. And you know, I have to put retirement, I don't have any retirement money, so I said, you know, I thought to tell them, which is not my main motivation, but that I want to put some money aside. And, I would like to start an EMBA program and do, I think to ask the Security Bureau just directly, I, we have a policy that we're honest with them, and say, I like, I'd like to start an EMBA program, I'm attracted to Shenzhen, can you help me uh, find a place? Uh, can you help me find a university that might want to work with us? And my idea is, and I, this is the cool, I want to call the EMBA China Soft Power EMBA. Uh, because there's a distinction between China's soft power and China's hard power. So Chinese hard power is economic and military. And that's very well known in the world. So when you think of China, when a Westerner like Trump thinks of China, all they see is the hard power. They see money and they see military. And the Chinese soft power is very, very beautiful. This is the literature, 5,000 years of literature, you know, and the Nobody in the West knows about, even the most famous books like Journey to the West, they've been translated, Arthur Whaley, I think. Um, <coughs> but they're not, if you, if you ask somebody, name me three famous Chinese writers from 5,000 years of history, you won't get one. From, you ask any American in the restaurants here, where you go, you give me, uh, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> give me give me two two famous Chinese writers, you know, like any like Dostoevsky or um, Shakespeare, and they'll just say I don't know, 
you know, and that means people just don't know about China Soft Power. So I thought to call it a Chinese China Soft Power EMBA, uh, and then attract business people. And I want to do three uh, subjects: uh, China Soft Power, uh, leadership, and innovation. So that the EMBA will have three parts: uh, you study leadership, you study innovation, and you study China Soft Power. Uh, so. So we just make the degree those three things, like the businessman who wants to get a degree for his mom mm -hmm. to put on his wall, you know. Uh, he'll have to study course eight, DCI eight, uh, which is a good course. Uh, it's a really good course, and it's getting more sophisticated now. I think we just did it in Singapore, and I think it's getting really sophisticated. Uh, and in course nine, which we'll roll out this year, we, we did a preview in November here in this building about innovation. Because there's still a small uh, rap. Rap means a bad talk or something. There's a rap about China that they're not innovative, that they copy things, so, uh, which is no longer true, which is becoming not true. Now the Americans are copying the Chinese. But anyway. Uh, so innovation is a big topic. And leadership is always a big topic in business management. But then the third part of the course will be China soft power. And you have to come to a class and study Yuan Tse. Uh, so that when you go overseas to sell your automobiles, you can talk intelligently about the literature of your own country. You know, like you can, you can talk about Chinese literature. Uh, and impress your American friends that you're trying to sell your car to <laughs> and teach them about Chinese soft power. So I thought to call the degree China soft power. Mm -hmm. And then I think the government might be more likely to appreciate it. And then my idea is that if we partner with the university or even this company, which is called what? Zhongwei. Zhongwei. There's a company in Shenzhen that offered to have me teach there. They actually have a separate building that they already do cultural studies in. So the owner of the company is interested in traditional Chinese culture. And they invited me to go there and teach. And I went there. I talked to the main people. One very sweet lady, very sort of sweet lady who, who grew up with the company. So she wasn't a, f a rich person. She comes from modest background. but she joined the company early when they were two people. And she grew with the company. And now she's this modest, friendly person who's powerful. And uh, you know, so she, and she took me. She took me on a tour. And she was very sweet. She came out and held the umbrella over my head like, like this. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and she, uh, she begged us to go there and teach uh, cultural studies of some kind. And uh, so I thought uh, maybe to, if we can say that they've invited me in August to go talk about it, just to talk about it, I thought to offer to the Security Bureau that first I'll stop in Beijing if you want me to, and I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I mean, I'll write everything first and send it to them. But then I'll say, can you help us? And is this appropriate? And what do I have to do? You know, and I'm, I'm getting tired of these tours. It's, it's tiring. I'm 64 years old. You know, I kind of would like to sit uh, more often and teach for five days or 10 days uh, in Shenzhen. And um, so we've canceled our Beijing tour to go talk to this company in Shenzhen. And uh, I think that's a good way to tell the security bureau what, what I'm doing and say, can you? Is this something you would approve? And in the China soft power section of the course, I'm going to teach people to read the Tibetan for this famous Chinese book, which is missing. Parts of it are missing. And then we will restore the Chinese, and we'll translate into English. And then the whole world can appreciate uh, this great writer. And for me, it's exciting because when Yuan Tse, 700 years before in Tsongkhapa, it's a window into how did Chinese Buddhism start. 
you know, the, the unique uh, traditions of China, which are different from India and Tibet and, and Japan and Korea, you know, how did it start? Like, we don't have a lot of books by, we don't have books by Xuanzang. We just have this political record, which is how many uh, kinds of grain do they grow and, you know, how many military do they have, and, you know. We don't have, he's the earliest window into uh, how many years? It's about. Uh, how many years ago? Yeah, it's 1300 years of Chinese culture. This is the window to the earliest writer, you know, and it's only in Tibetan, uh, the whole thing. And I can read it, like, easily. So I can teach the business people about their early Chinese culture. Then they can spread Chinese soft power because they will know. They will know in detail something about the early days of Chinese culture, uh, philosophical culture, uh, in Xi'an, in the capital of China. So that's how I want to sell it to them. Any comments? It's great. <laughs> and I want to call it China soft power <laughs> degree <laughs> or something like that. You know. Again, it's uh, uh, just so you know. It's a uh, sip. What does that mean? Yeah. Oh, and I'll show you this. It's us. Uh, also, you have Lord Buddha as 2500 BC. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's 500 BC. Oops. Oh, I, I changed uh, that. Uh, he uh, changed it in the Chinese translation. Okay. Um, it's uh, just so you know. It's, uh, we're out of time? Yeah. Okay, tomorrow I'll show you the list of books and the dates. Mm. Uh, you're up in one of the. I'm not sure it'll be you, but you're, you're done earlier than most people. Your book is done earlier than most people. You're available earlier than most of these guys. Some of these guys are locked into their book for 10 years. <laughs> you know. Uh, but I may, uh, I have a dream to teach it in China, and officially. And uh, in, there's a person from Beijing University who is, who is interested, uh, who's a famous uh, cultural studies professor. But I, I kind of would rather work in Shenzhen. <laughs> no, I just had, uh, sometimes when I'm uh, half awake, I have these ideas. It came in my sleep, yeah. Uh, this thing about China soft power. And I think it will be sexy to the government. Uh, it, it's, it's a way they might approve it. They might not approve it. They might say, no, we don't want that. And that's okay. And then I'll do something else. I'll just keep touring and forever. <laughs> but uh, I won't stop touring, but I... I would like to sit in China for a week or two and, and work with a group of people. And my vision is that people in the class could be three types, normal students of the university who are curious, uh, translators of DCI materials who want to know about Yuan Tse, and then uh, yeah. EMBA rich guys, those three kinds of people, and specifically no Buddhists no monks, no Tibetans. Uh, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not interested in doing a religious movement in China. It would just cause everybody trouble. You know, I, I, I just want to read this thing with, this, this great book of China with Chinese people. And I would like to sit in Xuan, Shenzang and Shenzhen, not in Xuanzang. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, just enjoy it there. I, I don't get to enjoy the place. I, all I see is a hotel room. Mm. I could be in any city in the world. It doesn't matter. I never get outside, you know. Uh, and I'd like to kind of see the culture a little bit, uh, you know, which is mostly coffee shops. <laughs> but anyway, that's my idea. And then I, give me comments, <coughs> and then I'll write something to the Security Bureau. What I've learned is that if you ask them for their help, and you offer to be a partner, uh, you succeed a lot better, I think. Uh, and, and if you're very honest about what you're doing and you don't hide anything, they really don't like it when you try to hide something. So it's better not to have anything to hide. Okay, last thing. Uh, I was curious why the Tibetan version of his name is so far off the Chinese version of his name. And it turns out the Tibetan version of his name is correct. <laughs> and he was Korean. Oh. <laughs> and <laughs> his name is Wen Sink. 
And he uh, was born in Korea. And uh, he came to Xi'an at an early age, and I believe in his teens or his 20s, and he lived his whole life there. So, I mean, essentially he became Chinese. Uh, but he did go back to Korea and help start Korean Buddhism. Uh, and I think that's an interesting mm -hmm. angle, but I'm not going to go there with the security guard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what they're teaching. Because everything's so delicate in Korea right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible we could do it in Seoul. I mean, people might be interested. I don't know if his book exists in Korean. Maybe someone can find out. You know, uh, maybe Koreans would like to hear about it. If the government of China says no, you know. He's but also a prince. He was a prince? Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's pretty typical for great, uh, for great scholars. He came to China at 15. Say again? He came to China at his age of 15. Oh, and he stayed. Yeah. 15. Yeah. He, when he was 15, he came to China. Yeah, and I, I think he went back home for a while before Korea was really Korea. <laughs> uh, it was called a different name. Yeah, Mong Kao or something. Uh, anyway. Some of the peninsula was a country, not the whole thing, so something like that. Mm -hmm.